Okay, there's about 30 people online. Good afternoon and welcome to the, the April uh, Living with Disability Research Centre seminar. I'm Chris Bigby, the Director of the Living with Disability Research Centre here at La Trobe University. Um, we've got a varied audience of people who are academics and service providers and advocates and family members interested in issues around people with intellectual disabilities. So we've got two speakers this afternoon, and I'm going to introduce the first speaker, who is Dr. Elan Weasel, who is now an associate professor um, in urban geography at the University of Melbourne. Um, and he and I have had a long term research partnership, which has been looking at um, at encounters of people between people with intellectual disabilities and people without intellectual disabilities. So he's going to talk this afternoon about uh, possibility and risk in encounters between people with and without intellectual disability. His, his talk is based on a paper which was published in a special issue of the Journal of Intellectual and Developmental Disability at the beginning of this year. Um, and there's a whole series of papers around the issue of encounter in that special issue. So over to you, Elan, to talk about possibility and risk in encounters. Thanks so much, Chris, and hi, everyone. I can't see your faces, but I, I believe that you really are there. Uh, so um, I'm Elan Wiesel. I am uh, from the School of Geography. Uh, let's see if I can move the slide. So my talk really is about risk and possibility in encounter. And as Chris just mentioned, uh, it's part of the special issue. It's a paper and I've co-authored with Chris, also Peter Kamstra and Jane Farmer, uh, titled Possibility and, Risk in, oh, Possibility and Risk in Encounter Between People with and Without Intellectual Disability. Uh, I should say also this special issue has some really excellent uh, contributions on that concept of encounter uh, by Lauren Blanc, who wrote about uh, non-encounter, which is a really interesting uh, idea, and uh, Femian uh, Berdewold, who wrote about, uh, again, and sort of non-encounters and encounters in, in Dutch neighbourhoods, and some work by uh, Stacey Clifford Simplican about encounter from the perspective of uh, freedom using feminist uh, theory around freedom, and Chris Bigby and Sian Anderson's work on encounter uh, the, all the planning that goes into creating encounters, uh, it seems like an accident, that's part of the title, uh, but there really is sometimes quite a lot of planning that goes into it. So there's a lot to read there. I encourage you all to have a look at the special issue if you're interested in encounter. Uh, and I'll speak today about possibility and risk. First, I want to uh, reintroduce encounter. Um, uh, and maybe start with some dictionary de definitions rather than necessarily academic definitions. And to me, some of those definitions help sort of explain why we use the, the, the word encounter rather than say contact. There is a, a whole uh, body of literature on contact theory, uh, which is not very entirely dissimilar to encounter, but encounter does carry some, I guess a particular tradition uh, in, in academic research and some uh, implied meanings that I think are quite significant. So let me try to um, pull out some of those implicit meanings of the word encounter. Um, so in, the, in Cambridge Dictionary, encounter is defined as a meeting, especially one that happens by chance. So the chance, the, the, the difficulty to, uh, to predict encounter, the unpredictability of it. And there's an example of uh, how you might use it in a sentence. I had an alarming encounter with a wild pig um, there's something here also in that example that I think is quite important is that idea that the encounter also brings together a uh, difference. Here is a person and a wild pig, but it's also about people who are different. And here is the questions about disability and intellectual disability as a form of social difference. All of that is actually uh, quite um, implicit in the, uh, in the notion of encounter. Again, a chance meeting in, in Merriam-Webster Merriam Dictionary. And the idea that encounter as a kind of meeting has, I guess, specific um, meanings. It's not just any kind of meeting. They, they describe it as a particular kind of meeting or experience. Uh, for example, a romantic encounter, a sexual encounter. So there's something about encounter that is potentially uh, meaningful. 
So those ideas about encounter, those sort of implicit meanings of unpredictability, difference, tension, connection, uh, meaning, discovery, and, and the potential for transformation. Sometimes we think about, we look retrospectively at encounters that we've had and we can think, oh, that was my first encounter with the person who is now my best friend. Oh, that was my first encounter with, uh, with theater. So uh, retrospectively, an encounter can be recalled as a sort of fateful moment of transformation, the beginning of something new. Uh, so that is one of those possibilities of encounter. It's quite rare. Not every encounter you, you experience, in fact, uh, very few uh, encounters are likely to ever turn into a meaningful relationship. But that possibility is always there. And when you look at it from the other direction, when you, when you look at your uh, kind of more significant relationships, they've all started from an initial encounter. Uh, so that's one possibility. But also the encounter itself, whether or not it leads to a long-term relationship or something kind of more meaningful in the long term, in itself, there's something that's very significant about encounters. Uh, we call it conviviality. Not every encounter is convivial, but some encounters are. And that's the sense that there's some form of connection between yourself and a person, a stranger or an acquaintance. Uh, there's some moment where the labels that you both come from, come with, uh, suddenly sort of, they don't disappear. You, you might still be a person with a disability uh, and an academic, but uh, those labels, labels might become less significant in that moment of interaction and that moment might find, you might find something that brings you together, some kind of shared uh, identification, shared experience, and we call that conviviality. And I guess Chris and I, we wrote about encounter as, as a form of inclusion, as a dimension of inclusion, uh, where those moments of conviviality are just as important uh, aspect of inclusion in our daily lives as more lasting uh, friendships. Uh, because our lives, especially if you live in a city and you're surrounded by strangers, your life is full of those everyday encounters and, and those define the extent to which you feel belonging and conviviality. So that's why uh, people like me are interested in encounter because it sort of has those implicit meanings of unpredictability, difference, tension, connection, and the possibility, however unlikely, of transformation at the individual level or the social level. Um, and encounter has those possibilities, but it also brings about risks. And because encounter is so unpredictable, un it's not unplanned, uh, I, I need to be careful using it. It's, it can be planned, but it's unpredictable in some ways. And, and that carries, possibilities but also risks and for people with intellectual disability uh, maybe the primary risk is that risk of exclusion uh, being reproduced at that moment of encounter that in that moment that they're facing another person and they're being ignored or laughed at frowned upon for behaving in a way that uh, seems inappropriate for social norms uh, being misunderstood or even being just kind of flatly abused, those are the kinds of risks that um, exist in encounter for many people with uh, intellectual disabilities, as well as many other people. Um, so I'll talk a bit more about uh, the specific risks uh, that come with encounter. This is sort of the, the point of the paper. But before I do that, I want to, to talk about risk a bit more conceptually, because that's also a very important concept in itself. So what is risk? Um, risk is the idea that there is uncertainty about the future, and more specifically, particularly uncertainty about future outcomes of choices and decisions and actions that we make now at the present. Um, the word risk carries the sort of implicit negative meaning, so it's really, when we say risk, we really think about the negative outcomes, possible outcomes of choices and actions we make. When you say to take a risk, it also implies uh, the risk taker's awareness and responsibility for those uh, outcomes or possible outcomes, uh, which brings, uh, that connects the concept of risk to uh, 
the concept of risk society, which is um, an argument about the shift in society, the devolving of risk uh, from, from governments and, and from society to individuals, the individualization of risk. Uh, because we carry as individuals responsibilities for the risks that come with our actions. Uh, in disability research, uh, there's uh, quite a lot of literature now about the individualization of, uh, of disability support and funding. And, and some of that work tries to understand that in relation to risk society and the devolving of risk and responsibility for risk to individuals. So that's where the concept of risk come from, comes from. And there's another concept which is managing risk. Uh, and that's the idea that uh, decisions and choices we make are often made by trying to weigh the possible rewards against the possible harms of any action we take. Um, now, we do that in our daily lives uh, as individuals, we do those sort of risk assessments all the time. We do them instinctively, intuitively. We don't often think about it uh, necessarily consciously, but we do it all the time. Uh, we're very biased in the way we, we make those, uh, I guess, that weighing of risk and rewards. Um, we have, uh, I guess, some of us weigh risk more than others. Some of us are blind to some risks, while also uh, potentially imagining risks that are not necessarily actually there, uh, those sort of virtual risks. Um, whether or not we are willing to take risk after we've did, done all that sort of uh, calculation of uh, weighing risk against reward. Some people might be more optimistic and still take the risk. Other people might, might be more fatalistic and be more risk averse. So our past experiences, our personality and, and many other factors come into play in the way that we um, weigh rewards and risk and the way that that shapes the decisions we make. And specifically today, I'll, I'll talk about how this shapes our decisions to participate in an encounter and how we also behave in an encounter because um, that also is shaped by our uh, risk assessment. There's um, people with intellectual disability have a long and, and very troubled history uh, with this sort of concept of risk and its twin concept, vulnerability. So I, I talk about vulnerability as a twin concept of risk because risk and vulnerability are closely sort of intertwined. Risk is understood as emerging from exposure to a hazard, uh, an external danger. Uh, it could be an object or an event uh, that can cause harm. Uh, but it's also interaction between that hazard and, and, and vulnerability, which is more internal according to some of the risk literature uh, so the, the vulnerability of the person who is exposed to a hazard. Uh, so take, for example, a child and, and a frail older person and they're both skiing. Uh, it's the same hazard, the same risk of falling, but uh, one of them, the, the frail older person, is potentially more physically vulnerable to get seriously hurt if there's an accident. So the level of risk depends on vulnerability as well. But in disability studies and in disability advocacy, uh, Many have been very critical of the way that people with intellectual disability in particular have been labeled as vulnerable uh, because that label uh, leads to sort of uh, overprotection of people with intellectual disability uh, to safeguarding practices that really restrict uh, people's freedoms uh, and their choices and exposes them often to institutional types of uh, living. Uh, that only produce more risk in some ways, uh, it all in the name of protecting vulnerable people. So risk and vulnerability uh, are, have been very difficult uh, concepts for people with intellectual disability. I have here a quote from 1973 uh, by Robert Persk, uh, almost 50 years ago now, and he wrote about the dignity of risk and really challenging that notion that people with intellectual disability need to be uh, treated as, uh, as vulnerable and need to be protected for their vulnerability. And he writes, overprotection may appear on the surface to be kind, but it can really be evil. 
an oversupply of sort of overprotection can smother people emotionally, squeeze the life out of their hopes and expectations and strip them of their dignity. I won't read the whole quote, but he writes further, you know, many of our best achievements come the hard way. We took risks, fell flat, suffered, picked ourselves up and tried again. So taking risk, experiencing the harms that might come with risk, but then also experiencing the benefits is part, is a form of dignity, but it's also just part of a good life. And, and Persk wrote about it 50 years ago. I don't know how far, how much progress we've made since then in, in shifting away from a very risk averse uh, approach to people with intellectual disability. Uh, but the thinking about it ha has been there for a long time. So I spoke about the potential risk and rewards for people with intellectual disability in those moments of encounter, the kinds of risks and rewards they might uh, experience, they might take into account when making those assessments about whether to enter an encounter in the first place, uh, and if they are experiencing an encounter, what to do. Uh, but there are also risks and rewards for other people involved in the encounter, the support workers and other people that they meet, they encounter the person without a disability that they might encounter. And let me speak about some of those uh, other perceived risks and rewards for other people. In, in, in my work with uh, Chris Bigby, we, we sort of, we've observed, we've done hundreds of hours of observations to, to look at encounters as they happen and see what happens. And then we also spoke to those people. We interviewed support workers. We interviewed uh, people who live nearby, I guess, group homes and, and their experiences of encounter with people with intellectual disability. And we were able to identify some of those perceived risks that support workers or other sort of neighbors uh, take into account and uh, shape their decisions whether or not to enter or to avoid encounters with their neighbor who has an intellectual disability. Um, what I found quite interesting when we tried to kind of bring it all together into a table that summarizes some of those perceived risks and rewards was that some of them are, are shared. Um, there's some, there are some similarities, uh, whether you're a support worker or a person with disability or a person without disability. There's, for example, that perceived risk of embarrassment. If you're a support worker, you might be embarrassed uh, by uh, the client who, uh, you know, the service user who might be behaving in ways that as a support worker you feel might be embarrassing. The person with disability might be embarrassed to, to think that um, they might be uh, embarrassed in some way by the interaction with another person. And, and we do know from speaking from other, with uh, the people, the neighbors, that they often felt embarrassment about not knowing the right thing to do, not knowing the right thing to say, and being quite fearful of saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing when they encounter a person with intellectual disability. So there's a sort of shared risk of embarrassment that uh, all participants in an encounter experience. But there are also sort of shared rewards in an encounter. And one of them is, is just getting to know another person. Uh, sometimes getting to know them in a very superficial level, just through a fleeting encounter. But as I said earlier, it could um, turn into a repeat encounter and over time getting to know a person uh, much, much more deeply. So there are uh, shared risks and shared rewards for all participants in an encounter. And to me, it's interesting because I, I think of that shared risk and reward as part of conviviality. It's part of what potentially makes encounters convivial. That moment of what we call conviviality as shared identification. Maybe those risks and rewards are part of that part of that shared experience. But there's of course other elements here that are different uh, for the person with a disability, for the support worker. They, they face also different risks and different rewards uh, which shape their decisions. How do people act on those perceptions? So if they perceived uh, encounter to be risky or, or potentially very rewarding, how do they act on that? And here it depends on many different factors, but uh, you could sort of summarize that as sort of people who lean towards risk aversion and people who lean towards uh, risk enablement. 
Uh, I'd like to talk about those two uh, different approaches to dealing with those perceived risks and rewards that come in every encounter in different ways. So risk aversion, and to me that's, that's the most significant barrier to encounter between people with and without intellectual disability. Those practices of risk aversion, the, the bias towards risk aversion. Risk aversion means a tendency to avoid or to prevent encounter due to perception that the risks out outweigh the benefits. Um, and sometimes just ignoring the benefits and only thinking about the risk and then deciding to, uh, to avoid uh, taking that risk. And as a result, uh, we see people uh, really just not going into encounters where there is an opportunity for some kind of interaction with a stranger in the street, in a park, in a public library. People just avoid that. And sometimes that's due to a decision made by a support worker. Uh, you can see in this picture, that's a re recreation of a, an encounter that was observed in our study. Uh, there's a support worker who's physically uh, shoving a person she supports away from a stranger in the park uh, to stop the interactions from happening. And there could be all sorts of reasons for that, but really it's about a perception that there's some risk in, in that encounter, that something might go wrong, and that would uh, reflect badly on, on the support worker, and it could cause harm to the person, or whether the service user or the stranger they've met. So whatever risk they've perceived, they, they've taken action to stop that encounter from happening. Uh, and we've seen that quite often. That was observed many times in our study. Uh, so that's a sort of risk aversion practice by support workers. But of course, some people with disability themselves can have uh, risk aversion uh, biases. And we interviewed people who said, you know, that they'll avoid places there where they're likely to meet other people because they, they are kind of worried about the potential risk in, in meeting other people. And we spoke to, to neighbors living nearby and asked them about whether they avoid or kind of seek or respond to opportunities for encounter with their neighbors who have an intellectual disability. And some of them said quite, uh, I think quite honestly, one of them said to me, uh, well, we, I, I try to avoid, I actually go the, the other way, you know, the other side of the street. Uh, and, and when we asked why, he said, because it's very difficult to disengage so once you've kind of entered an encounter, it's very difficult to disengage. So you said that person speaks a lot and I don't know how to disengage from that. And to me, again, it's a, it's a, it's a risk aversion practice. They sort of identified a particular risk of not being able to disengage, of wasting time from their perspective. Uh, and the strategy was simply to, to avoid the encounter altogether. I think, when we talk about support workers, I think it's important to also know that the, the risk aversion can be personal, it can be about the, the specific individual support worker, but sometimes it's institutionalized. There are sort of services that have uh, practice frameworks and policy frameworks that are risk averse, risk averse uh, I guess, in a more uh, institutional, organizational level. So those support workers are encouraged by their own policy uh, to avoid uh, those potential risks. Whereas the rewards that might come with that encounter uh, are ignored again in, in this sort of institutional framework. So that is risk aversion. But we've also seen in our, our sort of observation examples of risk enablement as, a, as a the, I guess, the alternative approach to managing or to dealing with risk. And that's the idea that uh, despite perceived risks, uh, you initiate encounter or you respond to encounter opportunities. And, and when an encounter happens, uh, we've also seen people who engage in the encounter, who engage in ways that might be risky. And I'll give an example of that. Uh, one of the, a woman with intellectual disability we spoke to uh, talked about, oh no, sorry, that was an observation. She, she was in a, in a shop and she just approached another woman who was shopping there. And she started the conversation, but right away she just sort of asked her, do you think I'm stupid? And what she did there, she, the way I interpreted it at least, is she 
she brought the sort of difference between them. She brought her own intellectual disability and perceptions of intellectual disability to the surface rather than making it sort of invisible. And that's a risk because it creates embarrassment and it highlights difference rather than shared uh, identities. Uh, but in doing so, she also created, I guess, uh, an opportunity for a more meaningful encounter where I guess a more honest encounter where people are actually discussing uh, both their shared uh, identities and identifications, but also the differences between them and some of the tensions. Uh, so to me, that was a sort of a very uh, risk enablement approach uh, taken by that woman with intellectual disability uh, who we've joined in, that, in our shopping. So we've seen people with intellectual disability kind of taking risks. We've seen also support workers um, willing to enable risk and, and, and working to enable risks, sometimes by using strategies to, to minimize the harm. So they knew there was a risk and they will do all sorts of things to, if they thought there was a potential possible harm, they'll, they'll try to minimize it in some way. So one example was uh, desensitizing a person. So if they thought a person, a service user with an intellectual disability, might get too agitated in an encounter in a, in a very busy place, and uh, they'll first uh, bring them to that place or come with them to that place uh, in a quiet time where there are very few people there, so there's less, uh, I guess, uh, sensory stimulation, and they sort of build it over time. Uh, so that was sort of a risk management strategy to, to minimize the possible harm, the harm here being the person they supported uh, getting very agitated by overstimulation. So that, that was one way of enabling risk. But other times, we've also seen support workers just standing back and not doing much, not doing anything at all sometimes other than sort of observing and, and allowing an encounter to happen, allowing the risks, whatever they were, to, to be, to just be risky. And, um, and I think some of those encounters were actually quite meaningful because the risk to me is also part of what makes the encounter uh, meaningful or convivial, the shared risk. So I'm a geographer, as I said, and I like to talk about space and places. So I also want to talk about the places in which encounters happen and how spaces can create or uh, enable or I guess manage risks in certain ways. Uh, so, as I said, the call for encounter is in many ways a call for risk-taking. Encounter literature highlights, despite that, encounter literature highlights that to, to I guess, promote encounters, you also have to have what the literature describes as safe places, safe spaces. So people will be willing to engage in encounter with other people who are different from them. Uh, in all sorts of ways. They'll be willing to do that if they perceive the environment to be a safe environment. So it's about taking risks, but in a safe environment. But we've, uh, in this paper, we're trying to push this idea a bit further. And I have to say thanks to uh, one of the reviewers of our paper who commented, we were using safe spaces as, as a concept and, and they commented on how it's sort of, uh, in some ways contradictory to everything we wrote about risk being so, um, important element of encounter, of a meaningful encounter. So I'd like to talk about risk enabling spaces rather than safe spaces and some of the characteristics of spaces that enable risk but also provide a degree of safety that makes, um, that makes it possible or more uh, easier for people to uh, engage in encounters, to be more uh, risk enabling rather than risk averse. So what are those characteristics of risk enabling spaces that provide that balance of safety and risk? First, first characteristic is, is familiarity and, know and knowable elements within the, the space. It could be physical elements that are familiar to people that creates a sense of security and safety, but it, beyond physical uh, elements, it could be also about norms because places, every place has its own norms and boundaries uh, Femian Berdewold, uh, who, who wrote another piece in this uh, special issue, writes about built-in boundaries. So places where there are built-in boundaries about how you might need to behave actually provide a sense of safety 
uh, because people don't need to be too reflective about their own behavior. It's just kind of um, very clear. Uh, and that creates some safety. But I think to us as a sort of risk enabling spaces, that also needs to be balanced by spaces that are more open, open for explorations. Well, yes, there are boundaries and expectations and norms, but they're not too rigid, uh, which um, it also creates risk, but also allows some possibilities to emerge. Another element of risk enabling spaces are, I guess, a sense of safety in the, in the literature on safe spaces. They talk about safe of safety, sense of safety deriving from trust in the people and the institution who manage the place. Uh, and that those feelings of trust are maximized when people have an opportunity to self-produce or co-produce spaces uh, where they in, 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 participate in the production of those places. Um, so I think that's an interesting way of thinking about what makes some spaces uh, safe. Think, for example, of a cafe that's run by people with intellectual disability. Uh, it might, it's a self-produced or a co-produced space for them. Uh, and they might feel more safe to engage in encounter in such a space, encounter with other people who are strangers or with familiar people. But again, there's also a risk that comes with those self-produced and co-produced spaces. It's the risk that comes with responsibility. If you're responsible for the space, uh, that also brings about risks. And to me, that's a positive thing. That's one of the uh, positives of encounter risk is that uh, you take also responsibility for that space. So that's another element of what might make some spaces uh, more uh, risk enabling. And in our paper, I won't go too much into it right now, but in our paper, we give some examples uh, of such spaces that are, are self-produced and co-produced. Another element of safe and risky spaces is the idea that you're in a place where you're free to enter and encounter with others, but you're also free to disengage. Uh, so that gives you safety because you know that you can freely come and speak to other people and you would not be frowned upon for doing that. But when you want to disengage with the encounter, you're also free to do so. So that's an element of safety. But it's also an element of risk because other people uh, can suddenly approach you unexpectedly and initiate an encounter with you. And they're also free to disengage from you uh, at that moment of encounter. So again, there's this sort of element of risk. Um, but also safety in, in those types of environments. And another fourth and last element that uh, we write about is be seeing and being seen by others. So visibility uh, in the literature about safe places is a big theme, how uh, there's a concept in urban geography of eyes on the street, uh, where when people can watch one another there's a sense of safety uh, because there's someone you can call for help because there are people monitoring, uh, I guess, behavior. So preventing potential uh, criminals from attacking other people. Uh, so that's that idea that being seen provides safety. Uh, but again, it also there's an element of risk. And again, I mean that in a very positive way uh, that seeing others also means responsibility for other people. And just as other people seeing you means uh, some responsibility for you. And I also add that on being seen, that to be seen is also to be judged uh, for your actions and for your appearance by others, which is another element of risk. So those are the sort of four elements that I'd like to highlight about the kinds of spaces that we think might uh, enable risk taking and enable en encounters that involve both risk. Uh, there's an element of safety in these spaces, but also they allow, they enable risk. So just to sort of conclude my presentation, I'll, I'll read this uh, sentence here. Encounters are shaped by conflicting perceptions of people with intellectual disability as vulnerable individuals to be protected from others, as hazards to other community members they encounter, or as self-determining persons with the right to take on risk for the possible rewards and the right to exercise the dignity of risk itself. Entering an encounter is indeed an act of, of risk-taking. And there's a common perception that 
uh, I think I've heard it in, in quite a few of the interviews I've done that people with intellectual disability benefit from those encounters while other community members sort of take a risk uh, in those encounters and uh, they do it for altruistic reasons, uh, but taking the risk without necessarily having any benefits from those encounters. Um, what I've tried to do and what we've tried to do in this paper is to challenge that perception to show that um, those risks, uh, there are risks and rewards uh, for all participants in an encounter, whether they have a person, whether they have an intellectual disability or not. Some of those potential harms and potential rewards are shared, like embarrassment or getting to know someone new. Uh, and to me, perhaps that sharing of risk and reward in itself is a form of conviviality. But the framing of an encounter as risky needs to be balanced by acknowledge, acknowledgement of the possibilities that come with encounter. And, and here I want to highlight a, a sort of a methodological question about how you, how you study those benefits, how can you observe them? Because when we did our study, which was all based on observational, or mostly based on observations, um, some of those benefits uh, can be observed at the moment. If you see a moment of conviviality, you see two strangers experiencing a kind of meaningful moment, uh, you could document that, you could observe that. But some of the more uh, other benefits, like uh, that encounter potentially leading into a long-term friendship, you wouldn't see that by observing an encounter. That would happen many, many years later. Um, so it, it raises all sorts of questions about how you sort of study encounters. What are the, the, the methods that might be useful? And I guess moving from the sort of methodological question, to me, this paper brings about the question of how do we shift attitudes in the community and in the disability services we are, uh, system from, from risk aversion as a kind of bias of how to think about risk and rewards to risk enablement, which I think would be, uh, I guess, recognizing that dignity of risk uh, and recognizing the possibilities that come with risk in encounter. So we're, this is sort of in some ways, uh, an interesting point in our work on encounters. We've sort of finished one big project on encounters. We've published quite a lot of it. Uh, but we also we think we are now in a moment, this special issue came out, there's uh, quite a lot of interest in encounters in, in the disability space. So we're always kind of thinking ahead, okay, what's the, the next questions? So I'd be interesting in hearing some more thoughts from everyone here about, you know, what is interesting about encounters and risk? Uh, and possibilities and where might that sort of research agenda uh, go from here and thank you for your your time and attention look forward to your questions thank you thank you Alain. that was great um i hope that that sort of spoke to people in lots of different ways i'm having uh, if you want to ask a question please put it in the q a box rather than the chat box but i'm having difficulty uh david actually seeing the q a box i can't seem to open it um but there's a question so david can you see the chat the q a box yeah i can see it so um do you want me to read these questions out i'll just ask i'll just ask the one first that's in the chat box yeah it says it's from charity it says thank you it was especially fascinating to hear about the relationships between risk enabling spaces and safety safe spaces allowing people a place from which they can choose what risk they want to take without having to face too many risks at once so that's a comment from charity but maybe maybe elaine could you talk a little bit more about what asked the, what what are these self-produced or co-produced spaces? Do you have some more uh, descriptions of those? You talked about a cafe that was run by people with intellectual disabilities. Are there other examples? Um, there, there was another example was social enterprises, and there was sort of uh, co-produced spaces uh, that also, I guess, create uh a sense of safety for people but also a sense of possibility 
so in, in the, the written paper, we elaborated a bit on those uh, social enterprises. And some examples were, um, for example, people with intellectual disability being uh, that they're workers in those social enterprises, they're, they're kind of like employees. Um, they have quite significant supervision uh, by, by staff, by other kind of non-disabled staff in the, in the social enterprises. So that provides a sense of uh, safety. Uh, but they're also, and, and some of the work that they do is very structured and protected. So they would go out, for example, into the community and uh, you know, knocking on people, people's doors or selling stuff and things like that. Uh, but there was also always, uh, I guess, another supervisor in place. And some of those activities were, um, I guess, protected in, in, in one way or, or another. So there were elements of risks, but there were also elements of uh, safety. But also there was an element of co-production there because uh, many of the uh, employees with intellectual disability also had a role as uh, mentors of other more sort of junior employees with intellectual disability. So, and that also involved a whole set of uh, risks and possibilities for those participants. So the social enterprises were quite an interesting uh, example. And that was based on, on work that was carried out by Jane Farmer and Peter Kamstra, our uh, co-authors on that paper. Thanks, thanks. Um, David, can you ask the questions in the Q&A because I still can't see them? Yep, sure. Um, and if you want to open them up as well, Elan, you, you, you can see them uh, there as well, just on Q&A. But I'll read the first one out from uh, Coral Fire. Did you observe uh, encounters of people during sporting activities? And do you think that participation in sport can be an agent for change in, in those societal perceptions? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think sport is really interesting. I think one of the elements in sport is uh, competition. And I've always been thinking about how competition creates uh, risk and rewards. And in, in some ways, sports are very structured in the way that they structure risk and rewards. Uh, it's how you win and how you, you lose. And I think in, um, in some of our early writing on Encounter, we sort of, I remember writing something about competitive sort of activities not necessarily being very conducive to conviviality because of that competition. And we saw many examples of people with intellectual disability being excluded from uh, competitions because it's seen as too competitive or too risky for them uh, and risky for others in the sense that, you know, I spoke to a person uh, who was a member of um, a bowling club and he said, oh, you know, we have, participants with intellectual disability in our, in our club uh, and they participate in most of our activities but not in the competitive uh, nights because uh, that's where it gets serious. So at that time we, we thought okay so the competitiveness in, is potentially uh, a problem for inclusion but I'm kind of trying to, to, to open my mind to actually think about it differently these days and to think Maybe it's not competition itself, but it's, it's unfair competition that is the problem. And if you, man, if you manage to, to create some kind of uh, level playing field in, in sporting activities that are competitive, uh, then I think maybe you can overcome those risks. And I've heard examples uh, of places where they've done that by, by using uh, all, sorts of, um, all sorts of mechanisms to kind of create a level playing field where a person with intellectual disability might participate. Uh, as an equal in a sporting activity. And of course, sport doesn't always have to be competitive. And, and there are many examples of sporting activities that are not competitive and have been very uh, conducive to encounter and to conviviality. Uh, I think dancing uh, was one of them in, in our research uh, because it's a shared activity and people kind of really get, um, I don't know, uh, embedded, I, I can't find the right word, but they kind of get really into it uh, in the sporting and that creates conviviality and uh, that works across uh, many boundaries of difference. And there's this idea, isn't there, of fandom, which is, you know, fans of going and, and that sort of being part of, of a large group of people watching something and supporting a team makes you feel part of that sort of group. Yeah, yeah, in the sporting event, but also after that, uh, many of our participants, when we saw encounters happening, 
uh, it started because someone was wearing a Richmond, uh, a Richmond Tigers shirt and that would start a whole lot of encounters in public transport and, and pubs and people approaching because it is a shared identification that people can relate to. Okay, David, next one. <coughs> so this next question is from Kang Wei, uh, one of our PhD students, and it's a quite a long question, so just bear with me. Uh, he starts off talking about uh, how he's read lots of your articles and they're very interesting, which is a nice start. Um, I've, I found that your research challenges my understanding about human relationships in Western societies, because according to my knowledge, human relationships in a, are established by their mutual attraction based on indiv individual internal traits, e.g. personality. But Encounter aims to create the external and environmental opportunities for human relationships. Actually, in this presentation, this presentation is very close to that in Chinese philosophy. In Chinese philosophy, relationships are determined by the supernatural power. For example, love is interpreted as yuan, which is decided by, the des by destiny or fate. So again, then goes on to say, so my question is, do you think that research about encounter represents a new direction of Western studies of human relationships, a shift and, and a shift towards the Eastern tradition? That's a, quite a large yeah. question. I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer this, but uh, you have, have a crack. It's, it's a great question. I think yeah. it's really interesting. I, I, I don't know much about uh, I guess the Chinese philosophy about uh, Yuan, but I mean, that's not the direction that we've been uh, thinking about shifting to an Eastern tradition necessarily, but I think it would be quite fascinating to engage uh, with other ways of thinking about social relations. I mean, certainly encounter uh, moves away from um, traditional Western thinking about social relations and conviviality moves away from some of the uh, kind of liberal Western thinking. So I haven't thought about it as a shift towards the Eastern tradition, but it might be. And uh, that's quite an interesting uh, thought to, to ponder. And I guess it's worth saying, you know, when we started on this, it was to look at what's that sort of gap between being present in the community and what was that time called participating, which was about having deep and meaningful relationships with people, that sort of space in between those things. Um, yeah, it's a very good question to think about things from other cultures and traditions. Yeah, and, and I think another thing in the how, kind of reflecting on how we started the, the work and where it's where it's led us, and I mean we started from thinking about inclusion and thinking about encounter as a dimension of social inclusion, which again is a very uh, kind of Western uh, liberal democracy um, sort of. 1990s ideas about uh, liberalism. And I, I think we've moved away from there uh, in, in the last couple of years. And we're starting to think of encounter in different ways. Um, like Stacey uh, Simply Can Clifford, who writes about encounter, not necessarily from a perspective of inclusion, but as a, an idea of freedom. So yeah, I think our, sh our thinking about the meaning of encounter keeps changing all the time, which makes it all the more interesting. Okay, David, next one. Uh, so this next one's from Sandra Beenham. How can people with intellectual disability practice encounters and learn the rules of engagement? Yeah, it's, I, think, I think the answer is in some ways is in the, in the question, like it's, uh, it's the practice. That's to me the... Um, the answer to how you learn it's i don't know if it's something that necessarily can be learned theoretically but i do know that people who experience many encounters in their everyday lives they develop skills um you know when you we all experience that you your first encounters as as a child or as an adult are, are very full of anxiety and over time you learn certain ways of dealing with those anxieties and, and dealing with the encounter uh, so i think of it is embracing the idea that you can't really learn those rules theoretically uh, and you just go out there and, and do it and I think if services thought that way rather than trying to to stop people from taking risks uh, by going out for encounters without knowing what to do and just allowing it to happen I think that's that's the way forward to me. But also the onus shouldn't always be on people with intellectual disabilities to conform to social rules 
yeah. think the rest of us have to learn to maybe live outside those social rules and accept differences and feel more comfortable with that too, don't you think? That's, that's a really good point, yeah. Anyway, okay, next one. Okay, so first just a comment from Jennifer Clegg. A local arts project had a day workshop on music making facilitated by music therapists. That was a great environment to introduce my partner, a fellow singer, to people who I work with in shared sessions, humming and drumming. Um, and then she's got a question. Uh, do you think changing politics rebalances the weight of risk and possibility? It, it feels to me that the pandemic has high, highlighted fear of difference, so the current environment may be a little more hostile rather than facilitative. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. I mean, we live in a society that is a lot more risk averse right now than than it has been just two years ago. Um, so yeah, I think it's true. I think risk risk aversion uh, is is on the rise rather than uh, risk enablement. But we, I know we we did do interviews for another project with people with intellectual disability, and some of them said. You know, we asked them about their experience of the pandemic and some of them said that they felt that some of the experiences that they felt for a long time that sort of characterized their lives forever, uh, sort of being uh, restricted in all sorts of ways. And, and they finally felt something that other people felt it too, that other people were also in lockdown and they felt what it was to be, um, to be told uh, what to do, when to do, and how to do, how, how often you're allowed to get out of your home. Uh, so they, they actually saw some positivity in that, which I thought was quite interesting. I don't know if it necessarily answers the question here, but it's um, yeah, another interesting perspective. Mm, mm, yeah, I think it's thrown up lots of, lots of new, new ways of communicating too. You know, it's very hard to, to communicate non-verbally if you, you know, facially if you've got a mask on um, and if you're trying to keep social distance all those sorts of gestures and things are much they're very different aren't they in that sort of setting that we've been in over the last 12 months yeah and and the norms have changed the norms of behavior in public have changed a lot and what you're supposed to do not to do and the risk associated with breaking those norms i had is now seen as bigger uh, and we do find that some people find it very difficult to to engage and learn these new norms and engage with them, uh, which creates a whole new set of risks. Okay, David, we've got time for a couple more. Yeah, we've got one more question and one more comment. So the question's from Lizzie Smith, who you know. Um, thanks, Ilan. What role do you see the NDIS, what role do you see NDIS funding playing in supporting convivial encounters and risk enablement? I think, I mean, the NDIS funding, I can see it working in, in, two, in two directions. I mean, there's many more than that, but the two directions that come to mind now was, one is, I guess, supporting people to, to participate in, in activities outside of their home. I mean, encounters happen in, in the public, in public or semi-public spaces, not necessarily in people's homes. Some encounters might happen in homes, but a lot of it happens outside. And then NDIS individualized funding can go for, to support people uh, to go out to experience those encounters, <clears throat> but then the, the support itself also needs to be well trained and uh, skilled to support encounters. So it's not just enough that people are, are taken to uh, you know to to other places, to shopping mall or the community center, but sometimes they would need some additional support to to get opportunities uh, to encounter, to actually interact with other people. <coughs> Sorry. So the NDIS, part of it is supporting people to, to have the, the, the funding, to, to have the support hours, to, to have those activities. But part of it should go into training support workers to, to have the skills to support encounter. And, and then another element of that is how the NDIS might support uh, not just disability support workers, but you know the rest of society to to learn about encounters and to be able to uh, participate in encounters in a more inclusive way. So I'm thinking about you know the uh, linkage, information linkage, and capacity building, and how that might potentially work to facilitate uh, opportunities for encounter in mainstream settings, 
uh, like those community centers and, and uh, sporting clubs and all of those. So there's all sorts of ways that the NDIS might uh, help with that. And, and I, if I might add, um, I think what our paper argues is that it's also about funding the behind the scenes work. So recognizing that support workers or programs might do quite a lot of work with other people in community groups, for example, that isn't actually face-to-face, one-to-one work with the person with intellectual disability. So it's recognizing that supporting encounters happens behind the scenes as well as sort of in the moment. Um, and I think that's something that the NDIS isn't particularly well attuned to in that it, it sort of assumes that everything that happens is only what happens in that moment with support workers. Um, so there's, you know, there's a sort of bigger picture about understanding the context that you need to work with to support encounters as, as well as that sort of one-to-one -one support. And as you say, that's different from the community capacity building of helping everybody else to be more inclusive and building their skills. So there's a whole range of ways you can support encounters um, with, with the funding that the NDIS has. And I'm not sure it's sort of really understood fully how complicated it is to support people to have encounters uh, that look like they've just happened, but the work that's sort of gone into that. Yeah. Okay, David, we've got a minute left. Is there, is there a quick one or not? Yeah, we've just got a final comment from Anusha. Anusha. Uh, my cousin plays in a competitive 10 pin bowling league for people with disability in the central coast uh, from New South Wales and she absolutely loves it but also but also general participation in the club and she says successful risk enablement question mark is that a good example of success successful risk, risk enablement it sounds like that yeah <laughs> no, yep. so and I think that's a really good example of some of people playing uh, you know, competition uh, which which is fairer, but still being part of a bigger club where they're where they're uh, bumping into to people without disabilities as well. That's yeah. that's sort of the best of both worlds in a sense, yeah. rather than being completely segregated. Um, okay, we might leave it there. Thank you very much, Elan. That was a fantastic conversation and some really really good questions. Thank you again. Thanks, um, everyone. If you want to read his paper, it is in JID, Journal of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, which Jennifer Clegg um, has been editing, and it's, it's freely available, it's open access, so you can just download it for free, uh, as with most of the other ones that are in that special issue. Um, we might just stop for, uh, it's one minute past four, we'll come back again at five minutes past four with our next speaker, which is Charity Sims Jenkins. So go, okay, welcome back. Uh, if you've made it back, we've tried to fix the Q&A, but we've not been very successful. So if you've got questions, put them, if you can put them in the chat and then we'll be able to see them better this time. Okay, so our second speaker is Charity Sims Jenkins. She's a PhD student in the Living with Disability Research Centre here at La Trobe. She's also uh, a, a social work graduate uh, from Flinders University, and she's worked uh, predominantly supporting self-advocates um, to be involved in self-advocacy groups and to do other sorts of, of work in the community. And she's sort of midway through her PhD and is gonna present a sort of overview of, uh, of the problem that she's, she's uh, trying to solve in her PhD and some of the theoretical perspectives behind it and then talk a bit about what she's about to do in terms of her field work. So over to you, Charity. Thanks, Chris. Right, so um, yeah, I'm going to be talking about staff perspectives and supporting adults with intellectual disabilities to be self-determined. As uh, Chris said, this is my PhD study. And um, Chris is one of my supervisors, along with uh, Dr. Tala Rutten Bergman. And, oh, good. Right. So I'll just start with my research aims. Um, so the purpose of my research is to improve staff support for self-determination for adults with intellectual disabilities. And um, I think, uh, you know, some of this is covered by Ilan, um, but I'll, self-determination 
uh, it's making your own choices and decisions. In the um, context I'll be looking at of staff support is in disability services with direct uh, support. So these are spaces where adults with intellectual disabilities are spending uh, a lot of their time and making day-to-day -day choices in their lives. So the aim is to test an intervention based on the stereotype content model, which is a theory that I'll introduce later. The changing staff perceptions, which are thoughts and feelings, and their intentions to support self-determination. So when I started this PhD about two years ago, I came in wanting to solve a problem. Um, I felt like uh, staff were taking control, being too overprotective, and this related to attitudes that they had. And then I'm here looking for a theory, um, what can be applied to change these perceptions. But um, so at that time, kind of coming from the point of view that it's other staff that need to change their perceptions, not me, I'm doing great. And just through my journey of all the nuances in the literature and the theory I've been looking at, I've really learned a lot about how these perceptions I'm going to explain um, apply to me as well. And I've really reflected on my past practice. Um, and I'm just hoping that in this short presentation, I can get some of that across that's been really illuminating for me. So my research questions are how do staff perceive, which is um, how do they think and feel about adults with intellectual disabilities? How do staff in disability services understand and intend to support self-determination for adults with intellectual disabilities? And do these understandings, perceptions and intentions change after an intervention based on the stereotype content model? So I'll start with self-determination in more detail, what it is, why it's important, before I talk about the issues and practices and the theories I'll be talking about. Okay, so self-determination is a right. Um, it's a key concept in the Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities. It's uh, part of the NDIS, which is promoting choice and control. And I'd say it's in these because it's important from a psychological perspective. Um, so acting on your own um, choices from your own intrinsic motivation from your inner goals and values is um, a psychological need comparable to physiological needs like food and water. And I'm going to go into more detail about what self-determination is because there's actually a couple of different ways or different angles of looking at it in the literature and um, you might be coming from a different way of looking at it uh, and they kind of lead to different ways of how you think about providing support. So I just want to clarify which one I'm coming from. And I hope you like my drawings. So, okay. So the most prominent literature on self-determination is um, I'd say from the psychological angle of seeing it as a characteristic or a skill of a person. Um, and so if you look at my picture here, I'm just gonna demonstrate this. Say that's you sitting in a chair and you want an apple over there on a table. Hope it looks like an apple. Um, and actually an apple's not the best example of a self-determined choice because like, it's not really coming from you know, values as much, but it, it was um, fun to draw it. Um, so what you need as a skill to be self-determined is listed here in causal agency theory. It's the ability to set a goal. I want to go over and, I'm sorry, to set a goal, I want to eat the apple, to plot a pathway toward the goal. So you can think to yourself, I'm going to stand up, I'm going to walk over, I'm going to pick it up. That's the pathway that you've plotted. And belief in your ability to take the action. So these are all psychological characteristics, um, your abilities that lead to you being able to take, make a choice and take action on it. And with this concept, you don't actually need to take action all of it yourself. Um, it's self-determined if you can just make a, a noise gesture or call out to someone and if um, they come along and bring you the apple because you made it happen, you set a goal, you put a pathway and you believed you could do it and you got it done. And so the focus here is on you in this concept and what, what you can do to bring about your choice into action. And um, 
But I hope that's clear. And um, I'll just say it's, this is not the concept I'm going to be using. Uh, this next one, as an ecological process, is the way um, I'll be looking at it. So this is a, a different angle on it. It is not about now what you can do, but looking at it as an ecological process, we're looking at what actually gets done to bring forward your choices and get you to a goal. So um, this ecological process model takes into account the role of the environment. Um, you're playing a part, your skills and characteristics are playing a part, because these are your skills and characteristics are part of the ecological process as well. And someone helping you is playing a part. And it goes even broader than that. You've got um, other influences that are accounted for in this um, model. So like what your family has said about eating apples will influence whether you make a choice and if they've said something to your supporters, then that will influence whether they give you the support. And you've got laws and policies and human rights that all um, influence your choice and whether it comes into action. So knowing that I'm focusing on what actually happens and not what you can do, um, we can say that you're self-determined if you don't actually do so much if all the support comes from the environment. So a supporter could step you through those psychological steps I described from causal agency theory, help you set a goal, help you plot a pathway and give you encouragement. And um, so for some people with severe to profound intellectual disability, being self-determined will rely a lot on a supporter's responsiveness and their ability to interpret your individual preferences. And I've included a quote here as an example to demonstrate that. So it's uh, from a staff member in a group home speaking about a resident. If you listen to Chloe and to her yelling at you, there's all different yell and you'll know like there's a yell when I walk through a door because she knows I'm here, or there's a yell that I need to go to the toilet. So you need to listen. Okay. So that's the supporter as part of a process and that's how I'm talking about self-determination. I'm talking about a process that involves environmental factors and support and I'm not talking about working with people to develop their choice making skills or at least I'm not talking about that by itself that can be a part of support for self-determination. So that's self-determination. So now I'm going to what's the issue in practice. So yeah so there's quite a bit of literature about their um, out there on the experiences of adults with intellectual disabilities showing that there's some poor staff support for self-determination. So yeah, and in this evidence there's examples say of staff monitoring and preventing sexual relationships, making decisions for people without asking, um, not giving people information they need, controlling money, making people adjust or change their clothes, so presenting socially acceptable images, not responding to their cues, options, not offering options, and leaving people disengaged. Okay, so yeah, these are all issues because they're stopping self-determination and, and I think they're also, Elan gave some examples as well. Um, so the not responding to cues, this bottom one, not offering options, um, you know, this is emerging more for people with severe to profound intellectual disabilities who need um, more responsiveness from their supporters and then other ones are more this over verbal protection so people who are able to take action on their choices but getting this kind of prevented and blocked. Now I've looked through the literature now about what's behind this and I divided what I found here into some themes so um, as you know probably from my lead up I'm going to narrow down into staff perceptions but uh, there's also external factors I want to talk about. There's a lot of overlap between these and um, it's not as neat as this, but external factors that influence how staff practice supporting self-determination. Um, if there's you know, only one bus for multiple people, if there's not enough staff available to support self-determination, if staff don't have enough training, these are all big factors. And the policies and processes, you know, that um, Ilan mentioned the risk society, the organisations of this responsibility to, of duty of care and protect people from risk. So this is definitely comes up in the literature as creating tensions with people's self-determination. 
And then when I look at perceptions, I've divided these into dehumanising and defending best interests. Um, and the dehumanising, you can see how that would limit self-determination if you're not seeing someone as human or as a burden and you're not wanting to support them or, you know, caring too much. But the, this was uh, in, before deinstitutionalisation, you were seeing more of this dehumanising perceptions uh, in staff, and there's evidence this has been reducing now with more community support, staff for the most part have humanising perceptions. So I'm going to focus now in a bit more on this defending best interests um, perception. So if you know the term best interests, I might be using it a little differently, but I'm mainly just kind of capture anything that staff are doing to um, help to get someone to the, you know, to the best support really. Um, and so things like um, trying to prevent someone from having hurt feelings or, or promoting a socially acceptable image. Um, you can see there's a lot of overlap with the, the risk policy stuff, but it's not all stuff that, um, you know, relates to safety or you know, write an incident report about. And so, I'm just going to read a quote now um, that illuminates these perceptions by a study by Altamark in Sweden. It really describes he was um, looking into the perceptions of staff when they're limiting self determination. He said they see themselves, staff see themselves as emotionally tied to the people they work with, personally responsible for their safety, acting based on an informal rather than formal relationship that they come to focus on the individual and their suffering rather than on overarching principles of justice. And they're doing so based on the presumption they have superior knowledge as to which choices are wise and which are not. And you can see how the superior knowledge, if you link it with feeling responsible and emotionally tied, would lead to overriding choices, for example, that are unsafe. But it's not always about overriding choices um, because of superior knowledge. This study um, of culture and group homes shows how there's a different way that well-meaning perceptions can um, be a factor in limiting self-determination. So here we've got even homes with better cultures providing better support, the staff applying a golden rule imagining what they would want in the resident's position. So they're not trying to override choice here, that people are trying to work out what people want, but they're doing it based on their own values and background. So um, this paper suggests a platinum rule would be more appropriate, trying to understand what the person themselves wants in that situation, given their background and values, but um, that this requires abstract thinking and knowing the person well. So I'm saying perceptions are a factor in practices that limit self-determination. I'm going to wanted to wanting to look for theories that'll help with that. And I'm looking at attitude change theories. And attitude change literature uh, takes three components of attitudes, which are thoughts, feelings, and behavior. And it's looking at the negative side of them, which is called the stigma model. Um, stereotypes are negative thoughts about people. Prejudice is feelings that are from endorsing these negative stereotypes and discrimination is the behaviours based on these stereotypes and prejudice. And um, just a reminder that the combination thoughts and feelings is what I mean when I'm saying perceptions. So in applying this model, there's been a lot of work in mental illness research on this and it shows that um, the stereotypes that emerge most leading to discrimination are fear seeing people as responsible for their behaviour and seeing them as dangerous. And this leads to feelings of anger or fear, which are prejudice, and the discrimination behaviours, segregation, coercion, withholding help and avoidance. So a lot of the stigma literature is modelling these things. And it's been applied uh, more recently with people with intellectual disabilities and the same pathways arise as with this mental illness stigma but it's, there's lower levels of it. So there's just not so much with intellectual disabilities that 
this is public perceptions of seeing people as dangerous and responsible. And, and so what this, these studies are saying, when, yeah, this is not much of this stigma that we're looking for, but we are seeing stereotypes of people being friendly and unintelligent. And studies of stigma with intellectual, people with intellectual disabilities have kind of found this sort of non-linearity. Non <laughs> non so, um, you know, stigma is sort of mapping things as this negative, behave, negative stereotype goes to a negative feeling to a negative behaviour. But what's being found when people are looking, when researchers are looking at these um, models, is I've got an example, I've got two examples on this slide. So in a study by Werner and Rattenbergman on social workers' stigma towards people with intellectual disabilities, mental illness and dual diagnosis in there as well. Um, I'm just pointing out this one pathway finding, there were others as well, but pity as a uh, emotion was found to correlate with helping behaviour and coercion. So coercion is seen as a um, discrimination, but helping isn't. So there's this, um, like, is pity good or is it bad? It doesn't really kind of fit. And in trying to understand this, um, you know, the, well, in the paper they've noticed that perhaps the coercion here relates to mandatory interventions and in ensuring well-being for people with limited capacity. So. Yeah, that's, and that's kind of what I'm wanting to find, but it's really, you know, it's, it's a maybe, it's, it's kind of obscured in this model. And similar, looking um, at another type of linear, non-linearity, um, another paper uh, has found low levels of stigma in their modelling. So again, not much of a dangerous stereotype, but in picking up on these um, friendly and unintelligent stereotypes, they've wondered, well, due to the combination, ambivalent combination of these stereotypes, um, people with intellectual disabilities, maybe they're being tolerated in the community because they're seen as friendly, but also not taken seriously, not receiving possibilities for self-determination, not having the opportunity to make their own choices. So there's, there's a lot of muddiness in the, from this model when leading to the types of behaviours I want to look at in limiting self-determination which is where I'm going to bring in the stereotype content model. So, okay, stereotype content model, instead of the linearity, it's plotting two dimensions um, against each other of stereotypes. So the warmth, there's a warmth dimension, which is seeing people as friendly or unfriendly, and confidence dimension, um, seeing people as competent or not. And they, they chose these two based on an idea that when you, when you encounter someone, oh, yeah, encounter, I think it's one, um, encounter someone you would um, at first want to assess, are they friendly or not? Are, are they going to help me or harm me? And then you want to know well, how, how much competence do they have to do that? And so they in plotting these, it's, it's now saying that you can have um, ambivalence, so part high, part low. And I've plotted these, and you can see the ambivalent ones in blue. It says um, high, you can be high in warmth and low in competence, or low in warmth and high in competence as combinations. And it's this top left quadrant that I'm going to focus on, because that's where in multiple studies, people with intellectual disabilities get rated with these stereotypes. Which leads to, we'll call these paternalistic stereotypes and they lead to paternalistic prejudice, which is a combination of um, feelings now, feeling warm toward the person, but also not holding them so much in high esteem. And they've actually called this combination, as well as calling it paternalistic prejudice, they call this combination of feelings pity which um, helps understand that previous slide perhaps. And then from this combination of feelings, we get um, ambivalent behaviours, benevolent discrimination. So paternalistic stereotypes lead to paternalistic prejudice, lead to benevolent discrimination. And 
each of these types of behaviours, I'm just going to describe. So I've divided them here, but they're always combined. The high warmth stereotype, which leads to the warm feelings, leads to behaviours of acting for, active facilitation. So explicit and overt helping, defending others. Um, so this is this deliberate trying to, to help. And then the low competence stereotype, which leads to low esteem feelings, leads to behaviours of passive harm, which is acting without undeliberate harm, neglect, avoidance, and dismissing. So you can see here this, this not taking into account the person's perspective. So my propositions, it's the reason I'm bringing this model in, is that I think this looks like the kind of behaviours I've been describing and the perceptions behind them with these staff practices. So my propositions are that staff perceive adults with intellectual disabilities with paternalistic stereotypes, so they think of them as warm and friendly but not competent. They perceive them with uh, paternalistic prejudice, feelings of caring and liking but holding them in low esteem. And that the staff have behavioural intentions that match benevolent discrimination, intending to provide the best support, active helping, but using their own values to judge this, instead of the preferences and the values of the people being supported. So that's the passive harm. And I've got one more proposition to come, but um, first I'll just uh, talk about what does this stereotype content model literature say that you should do about benevolent what should you do about <laughs> what should you do about benevolent discrimination? So there's actually not a lot of focus on intervention in this literature, but um, some re researchers. Okay, so the largest amount of research to do with benevolent discrimination is in benevolent sexism, where um, it's been observed that the most promising type of intervention is explaining to the people who mean well. Um, this, yeah well-meaning intentions, that what they're doing is harmful. And in intellectual disability literature, there's, um, there's not been much use of the stereotype content model, um, but there has been a, a growing understanding that we should listen to the perspectives of people with intellectual disabilities, kind of in the way that I've just described, described above. So there has been examples of interventions where people with intellectual disabilities are sharing harm that have been done to them because, you know, because there's this, growing, there's this understanding that it's a good idea from different angles like empowerment and or just, you know, knowing that we need to take into account the perspectives of people we're supporting. Um, but so far this hasn't been done from the theoretical perspective that I've just described that links um, warm intentions to why this kind of approach might be effective. Um, there is some literature that's noticing these links, but um, still not really an intervention looking at it from the, this theoretical perspective. So my next proposition, my fourth last proposition, is that staff's behavioural intentions for benevolent discrimination would be reduced if we did a perspective taking intervention showing staff how these practices of benevolent discrimination are harmful from the perspectives of adults with intellectual disabilities. And now I'm going to take you through my proposed or planned methodology, what I'm about to do. Um, I was going to start a field work for this uh, several months ago, but then, then COVID happened. So um, this is coming up for me. Um, the perspective taking intervention I've been planning is a possibly a two hour workshop still to be developed. Um, we'll be, I'll be co-delivering with self-advocates um, and with my links to self-advocacy group, it'll be approaching people that I know. Um, if you don't know what a self-advocacy group, they're a human rights-based group for people with intellectual disabilities or related impairments and um, at least people from the group I know and other groups as well can um, go out and give talks and things like that about their rights. So uh, I'll be working with people who are interested in promoting rights for other people with intellectual disabilities. And what's gonna happen in the intervention is self-advocates telling stories from the perspectives of adults with intellectual disabilities, not necessarily their own stories, highlighting how harmful it is 
to have self-determination limited despite staff's good intentions. And um, this is just about how I'm going to develop this with the self-advocates. So we're going to work together. First, I'm going to interview people one-on-one, -on -one, um, probably about five to 12 people about their experiences with staff support for self-determination. And then with each person, we're going to co-develop a narrative explaining their ex experience and make it into a story to be told. And I'm also going to draw from pers perspective taking literature when I work with them on this, that shows um, how to best present a story so that um, it gets across the harms that are experienced from people's perspective. And also I'm going to be um, doing focus group to make some vignettes. So the describing situations where staff might um, limit self-determination for people. And these are going to be used in interviews with staff, which I'll describe in the next slide. Um, so in actually making a workshop, uh, the intervention, I'm just going to work with two or three self-advocates on that. Um, hopefully ones who are the most, the most keen to, to do this and um, we, so that we can co-deliver it to staff. And I think I described this in the previous slide. Self-advocates will be actors and read out stories. So with this intervention, I'll be looking for changes to um, how staff see and understand things before and after the workshop. So I'll be recruiting staff through services they work for to the workshop. And um, the idea of the benefit from their perspective will be, you know, just this wanting to improve how they, how people provide support for people and the idea that staff will get a better understanding. Um, I'll invite staff to participate in interviews before and after, and I'll ask about how they perceive adults with intellectual disabilities and using those vignettes I described, how they understand and intend to support self-determination for adults with intellectual disabilities. These will be qualitative and semi-structured interviews and I'll be coding using hybrid inductive and deductive approach, which means I already know some of the ideas I'm looking for, but I want others to emerge too. I'm looking for changes in perceptions and intentions, um, what happens from before the intervention to after the intervention and any factors that emerge as relevant. So yeah, I'll be starting this soon after a long, long wait. And um, I'm really looking forward to, especially to the stories I get um, from working with the self-advocates as well, because I've already learned so much from this literature and I haven't even got to hearing the stories yet. So hopefully some of what I've learned has come across here as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charity. Well done. That was a uh, uh, you presented a lot of complicated ideas in a, in a, in a really simple, clear way. Well done. Um, if you can put your questions in the chat, it would be easier. There's two questions at the moment in the Q&A. So, David, can you look at those and ask maybe the first question? Uh, yep. Okay. Um, Hi, Charity. Are you open to including more people in your study? We are just opening an independent living site and this would be great for staff to be involved in to help them get their heads around this type of support. This will be a change in thinking for some of them. Uh, yeah, well, I haven't recruited anyone yet, so I'm very open. <laughs> um, might depend on location. I'm working with the self-advocates in Gippsland, but I um, actually, we, we might end up doing um, the intervention by video anyway, um, you know, with all this COVID stuff. So definitely open to that. I haven't got contact details here. Hope you can find me. <laughs> um, so if you want to offer to be part of the study, then you could send, send that to the LIDS uh, email address and it will get to charity. Yep. Yes, please. Okay. Um, okay, so the second one is... Um, I am a psychi psychiatry tra psych psychiatry trainee working in a dual disability service, i.e. Co comorbid intellectual disability and mental health. The issue of self-determination comes up quite frequently, but it can be challenging to find the balance between advocating for the young person and supporting the family. Are there any resources or strategies you would suggest to help clinicians foster self-determination and to communicate this to families? The workshop sounds great. Um, so I guess the way I'm coming from it is trying to build um, people's uh, self-motivation and understanding for um, why 
to provide, why they need to provide support in a different way. And in the actual uh, practice of um, how to do that, I probably want to defer to um, a lot of the uh, resources that are available through leads like support for decision making. Um, and yeah, that's a really good one. Is, would you agree with that, Chris? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, I would say that your work charity is really focused on, on, on support workers and trying to shift, hopefully, their, not their attitudes, but their intentions towards people. Yeah. And I think when you've done your study, you know, it, it, you might think about, well, does this expand to, to parents maybe? And, you know, we, we know from a lot of research that parents can often be fairly protective so your your research may well apply to parents but i think that's a bit of a way down the track um but i guess i should say that uh, together with jacinta and a team that includes elan uh, we've been conducting a, a study about support for decision making and developed a an evidence-based practice framework which aims to develop the capacity of supporters family members um and, and other paid supporters like support coordinators to build their capacity to support people to make uh, decisions or to participate in decisions about their own lives. There's a, a, there's a whole set of resources, there's a training program that's available on the Living with Disability Research Centre site if you're interested and some theoretical papers about, about that, which, is, which you can find. If you can't find it, send us an email and we'll send you the links. Do you want to say any more about that, Jacinta? No, I, I think that's really relevant. And as I was listening to Charity, I really see the sort of connection, Charity, in the work that you're doing, um, particularly with sort of exploring perceptions. I think um, it's, that's a really nice and and all a novel approach in some ways that fits in well so if you think about all of the things we've talked about today and our supported decision making or support support for decision making this fact that encounters can open up new pathways to all of those things come together in a space i think that is is actually probably framed by self-determination mm -hmm. um so a beautiful fit um clearly so yeah and i think our support for decision making training also the risk enabling training <laughs> that's available on the lids website would be really relevant for people if they're looking for you know ways of doing that and certainly there's lots of organizations who are now interested in in and in, in placing that sort of those concepts within their own practice so excellent <laughs> I think the other common thing is at the, at the center of our support for decision making practice framework is knowing the person. Yeah. Really knowing who this person is, trying to understand uh, what, what their preferences are. And, and that's what also what charities work is picking up and the damage that you may be doing to somebody, what it feels like for them if, if you ignore and override their preferences. So it's, you know, at that center, it's that really knowing the person well. Um, I think that's, mm -hmm. that's common across those strategies. Okay, Charity, so David, have you got another question? Yeah, there's another question from Coral. Have you experienced the attitude from staff that because it is, has always been done this way, then it must be right? I've, I've definitely seen that in the literature. Um, and yeah, um, I'd be interested to know how, whether this workshop, you know, how that would work with that kind of um, attitude from staff. But I think it's, um, you know, in the studies on culture, I think that's kind of one of the dimensions, isn't it? Um, that um, not being open to change. So, um, yeah, the, the yeah. yes, but, yes, we can, but we can't do it now or it's yeah. difficult or we'll do it next week. But, um, yeah, that sort of entrenched, it's like people often talk about having worked in the sector for 20 years as being a good thing, but they may well have had the same experience every year for 20 years, rather than, than developing their, their perspectives. Um, so I think resistance from staff will be interesting to see, won't it, in your study? Yeah. Whether yeah. there is resistance or whether people are open. I think the good thing is there's a lot of new staff coming into the sector that uh, don't bring 
sort of baggage from the institutional era with them, perhaps? We'll see. We will. <laughs> okay, David. Um, uh, okay, okay, so another one from William Crisp. Uh, Charity, that was a really interesting, interesting looking at the psychological literature on self-determination. I wonder if you've thought about whether self-advocates will shift perceptions of staff about the self-determination of people with higher levels of intellectual disability. Yes. Um, so that's something I'll be thinking about when working um, with the self-advocates on those stories. and. Um, Drawing from perspective taking and other literature, I'll be thinking about how to frame things to try to um, get that across. I, I'm thinking of, um, I want to make sure it comes forward how much um, it can be different for different people, different people with different backgrounds and different values. And if, if we can get enough of that across, um, it would be easy to explain how, okay, this also applies to another group with a different background again than the people talking. Um, and also wanting to make sure that some of the examples involve not just being um, stopped from getting from doing something, but also that not having support to do something you want to do. I think that will help as well. Okay. Um, Ilan, you've got a question. I was just trying to type it. <laughs> um, I, my question was whether there, you think there should be sort of different interventions, uh, one for people who are perceived to have uh, sort of low competency, but are seen with, I guess, uh, high warmth. And, and then another type of, inter which is, I guess, a, an intervention against paternalism in a way. And then another intervention that works towards people who are, you know, the lo low warmth, high competency, where it's, isn't it about uh, creating, it's about relationships between support staff and, and I guess, yeah, it sounds like those are quite different um, issues and I wonder whether two different interventions might be necessary. Um, so there's uh, four, four quadrants from the model. So we've got the high, high warmth, low competence, which is one type of uh, lisa discrimination. There's also low warmth, low competence. And I, I think that's where those dehumanizing sort of perceptions fit. And there's been, um, I've, I've read a bit like, a, I guess most of the literature and stigma is looking at that part of it with the all negative and um, theories like contact theory um, working in that space. With the low warmth, high competence, I haven't looked so much into that. I know it's called envious prejudice. Um, uh, but were you meaning the low warmth and low competence or? No, I, th I thought I was meaning to, to that group, the, uh, like, the uh, low warmth, high competence. I thought, I wonder whether if that's going to be also part of your research and if so, whether that falls under a similar intervention or does it require a different one? I feel it would require a different one, absolutely, actually, because what I'm building on in this intervention, it's really building on that existing uh, feeling of warmth and that, um, that you're already wanting to do best support for someone and that you just need to be shown that you're not doing that. But if you're feeling low warmth for someone, you're not even going to want to um, do anything for them. So it's a very different type of intervention, I think it would be. So one thing at a time, that's the next study. Okay. Yeah, okay. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank but you, great, great presentation and great study. Thank you. I think the point's really well made that you need different interventions for different intentions and perceptions of people, which we often sort of don't think about. You know, it's sort of yeah. like one intervention for everybody. Okay, so uh, uh, David? Yep, we've got a couple more. Um, thanks for a great presentation, Charity. Such fascinating ideas. You said that your feelings around self-determination were challenged through the course of your research. I'm wondering if you have yourself undergone the kind of transformation in thinking you hope to see in support workers, and if so, what were the insights that led to a change in your thinking? What were the insights? Um, I'd say I've undergone a transformation, but I'm actually not um, working really in the support space at the moment, so it's not coming into um, practice so much. Uh, I think the 
insights has been on um, realising that See, I was coming in mainly looking at that overprotection and stopping people from doing things and then realising that it's also that not being there is um, an issue as well and then going even further into not not taking people's values um, into account. So it's just as I'm, as I'm finding these things out, I'm realising that, you know, maybe I've wanted to say to people, oh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to block this. I'm going to, you know, support this. But then not, not taking, um, I'm not saying I didn't all the time, but it's like, yeah, I just really reflect on that and go, was I, was I really um, thinking from their background about um, maybe what things they're not bringing up because, you know, they're not sure, people aren't sure how to say these things. There's a lot of, um, I just realise there's a lot of nuance to it. Um, but I, I mean, I haven't even experienced the intervention myself that I'm uh, planning to work on. So I'm expecting to learn even more. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, this last one from Margot Sheehan. Uh, the concept of pity has struck me and I wonder if getting to know the person reduces pity. Getting to know the person can take time and this is structural. I'm thinking of the frequent changes a person with disability can have. So, I mean, that's interesting. So there's the literature on contact, which is about, you know, getting to know a person and liking them. Um, that is not really um, helping with this pity. But if you're talking about getting to know a person and really um, taking into account their preferences, um, that could be. But I guess it's just this awareness. You need this awareness of... Um, how pity can be harmful to reduce it, perhaps. At least that's what I'm leading to. Um, I think Margot's also talking about the time that it takes to know somebody and, and is that available to support workers when there's when the sort of change is happening in staff and people's lives? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess that's coming onto the the structural factors that I was talking about it's like um, you know we can work on these perceptions and intentions to um, not not be uh, benevolently discriminating but this is also going to be how much time do we have and those things are big factors that um, in, interrelates but you know it's not going to be solved by um, changing perceptions so um, definitely you can have perceptions or uh, intentions not to be um, discriminating but um, you're right you actually need to take the time to know the person and their preferences to be able to provide um, that best support and if you don't have the time to do that it's um, you'll still I guess be doing that discrimination just because you don't have the factors in place to stop it which goes, Sorry, that was confusing. Ecological, goes to the ecological model, doesn't it? Of yeah, the factors yeah. that influence. Absolutely, right? yeah. Yeah, and you're focusing on one particular set. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that the others have to be, the others need to have focus as well in other ways. So. Yeah, yes, exactly. And there needs to be work in those areas. I think there needs to be more um, understanding of the resources involved and um, providing for those. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Questions, David? Uh, that's it on uh, the Q&A at the moment. So anybody in the panel, Ilan uh, or Jacinta, have you got any comments you'd like to make to add to or other questions? I suppose from uh, just a little kind of, um, and it's, it's kind of related um, charity to, to the work that you're doing, particularly when you're introducing an intervention. and. And one of the things that has struck me with doing our interventions with people is that there tends to be a sense that now I've done it, I'm finished. Not you, but the people who have actually participated. And one of the things that concerns me is particularly around in our support for decision making framework is the getting to know a person. Because in fact, that's an ongoing process. It doesn't just finish and you don't have 
you know, you have some knowledge of the person, but as the person's experiences change, all of those things change. So um, one of my concerns with interventions is that we tick the box. We say we've done the intervention, it's all fixed, and now I'll go off and be this lovely person who supports self-determination. Um, but it may not actually, it may just become another stultified kind of construct that we hold on to that doesn't move on again. So even in some, I suppose my, my feeling here is in every intervention we do, we have to talk about them, not as a, a one-off fix it, but as an ongoing process. And you've got a lovely, lovely sense of different processes that you've talked about today. So hold on to that and hold on to the concept of process. Thank you. Okay, Yolan. Yeah, it's, I really enjoy the presentation. I think it's a great, it's a great research. I think there's there's something really powerful about also naming naming practices as part of uh, change and being able to. I guess part of the intervention might be. Uh, being able to name those pra practices of paternalism and there are different types of paternalism and even just being able to kind of uh, classify them and name them and then present those to to support workers so that they can know what it is that they're doing and have a name for it i think that could be very effective in changing attitudes and i guess another another comment i had was about and again, that notion of incompetency and perceptions of incompetency, and but maybe that can also be broken apart to incompetency, uh, incompetency around decision making, uh, and other incompetencies. Because I think um, th they can be quite different and shaping uh, self determination in, in different ways. Um, so it's about a support worker not really. Yeah, not having a lot of trust in, in a person's ability to, to even make decisions at all uh, versus uh, someone who's uh, accepting that a person has made a decision and, and wanting to help them with that, but maybe doing it in a, in a way that uh, is paternalistic. Uh, so yeah, I think, I think there might be some, something there about finding different types of uh, competency or perceived incompetencies. Yeah, that's a good point. What like uh, it's not that people are generally competent or incompetent it's always in something isn't it yeah. yeah it's like you may be really competent at some decisions and not at others so each decision is a is a fresh sort of uh set of of, of circumstances um which is the real problem about labeling people as not having the capacity to make decisions yeah you know, which is too global it's got to be much more differentiated than that i think um Okay, Charity, thank you very much. That was a, a really fantastic presentation. Um, and thank you, Elan, for your presentation too and for, for coming today. Um, we, if you want to get the, the slides, will be available on the Living with Disability Research website. We'll send them to you if you ask us in particular. There will be a recording from today that will also be available on the Living with Disability website and the YouTube channel that we have, which we'll put a guide to on the website. Um, the next seminar will be on Wednesday, the 19th of May. Yeah, May is the next month. Um, it's not the second Wednesday, it's the third Wednesday uh, for a change because the second Wednesday is the N NDS national conference so we've moved our present our seminar to the week after so as not to clash with that um, and it's going to be focused on uh on practice leadership uh, we're going to talk about the theory and the research that underpins this concept of practice leadership and uh, we're going to launch the new set of training resources uh, around practice leadership uh, and walk through some of those resources some of the, the, the fantastic video material that Maytree have helped us uh, develop around those. So please join us at three o'clock on Wednesday the 19th um, and we'll look forward to talking to you more then. Thank you very much for coming this afternoon and thank you again to our presenters.